Dear Lord, keep the doors of my lips that I might sin against Thee. In the Father and Son of the Holy Ghost. Please be seated. Does everybody hear me in the back? Shake. Yeah? Good? I need to be up a little bit. I am a low talker. I have a very deep voice. If you can't hear me, just do something like that, and I'll catch you and I'll raise it up. Sound fair? Unless you really don't like what's going on, and then you just let it go on as it normally does. Question for you today. You ever been truly good at something? You ever been truly called to do something? Have you ever felt confident in that call? Have you ever felt like this job, this occupation, this marriage, this parenting that you've been given, you're really good at? And God somehow, before the foundation of the world, before he determined to breathe life into you, before he knew your name, fashioned you with the idea in mind that this would be your calling. This is how you would fit into his kingdom. These are the gifts that he will give you to fit in and to expand his kingdom. I saw a commercial the other day, um, and what it showed was a handful of baseball players. Those baseball players were pros, and they were hitting, catching, and doing those typical plays of the week. I already ran one out. I need to start it. But doing those typical plays of the week that you normally see on ESPN. You know what I'm talking about? Where the guy runs up the wall and somehow leaps into the air eight feet and catches this little ball that's been hit about 80 miles an hour, 400 feet away, and it tags somebody out. These baseball players were doing this in this commercial, and what they did in between, as they were showing each face, was they showed video from when they were little boys. And they took the video out of when they were playing the Little League Championship. And what was really striking to me, what really stood out, is no matter what their form was, as adults, you could see remnants of that whenever they were children. So proper uh, foot placement, right? Proper swing, you saw them really choking up on the bat and hitting it out, and you saw them follow through on the swing. And what I'm getting at here is that despite all the mechanics that they've been taught over the years, all the practice that they have had, you really got the sense that they were gifted with something. Because about the only difference you saw between the two was age. You saw their face at a much younger age doing almost identical, identical things when they were young as when they were old. They were gifted. You thought to yourself, yeah, they were probably called to do that. God sh shaped them, gave them a talent that I don't have. Has anybody ever tried to run up a baseball wall and catch something? No? After mass, for those who don't pay attention, we're going right out there. and going to do that. But... That's easy for us to rationalize. That's easy for us to picture in our head because we all know people like that. People that are really good at their jobs. People that are good at being parents. People that are good at being spouses, right? Or praying for the church. But what about when they stink at it? What about according to world standards if they really aren't fulfilling that calling but they continue and try, right? Imagine for yourself some sort of mechanic that constantly works on your automobile. And every time they touch your automobile, they diagnose it wrong and fix the wrong thing and it continues to break down. It's your hose, it turns out to be a belt. It's your alternator, and really it was just a dead battery. It's your tire, and it's not, it's your steering wheel. Eventually the world would let this person know that they probably should move on, find another calling, if you will. Because they think that, correct? At the very least, you wouldn't take your car to them. The prophet we read about today, according to the world standards, would not be fulfilling his calling. A lot of people would tell Jeremiah, you might want to move on. You might want to do something else. Because Jeremiah, for all, you know, it's very safe to say, probably did not have one convert in his entire ministry. For decades, he did not have one person say, you know what? You're making sense. I'm going to listen to you and repent. Because Jeremiah came from a particular family, a high priestly and prophet family, Hilkiah, to where he was called to minister to the people of Judah. 
And when he went to Judah, and when God sent him there, he said, you need to tell my people to repent. They will suffer destruction. I will expel them from this land. I will send them into captivity if they do not repent. And not one person listened. See, unfortunately for Jeremiah, the people were okay. Everything was going smoothly. Josiah was king when he started, and everything under Josiah seemed to be going in the right direction. People started to repent a little. They had gotten rid of pagan worship. The borders kind of increased. And you know what? Assyria had fallen. And if we remember, Assyria, a hundred years before, had totally decimated the northern kingdom. If anybody's not familiar with Assyria and their methods, what they generally did was walk into your kingdom, demolish everything, poison the land, raise down your houses, and then they would kill the children and the elderly. Then they would take your wives and sell them. And as they put a hook in your nose as a man, they would drag you off to another kingdom, like cattle. And they did that and separated families like that for one particular reason. It's so that you would never get consolidated and revolt against the kingdom of Assyria. That's what they did to the northern kingdom. So as fathers and mothers were sent all over the Assyrian Empire, they most likely never saw their children, grandparents, their spouses ever again. And God warned them that Babylon is being raised up, and they needed to repent. And it had only been 100 years before that this happened, and they would not repent. Because to them, they were worshiping. Who's ever heard the old adage, whenever you meet somebody who may not go to church as much, may not be as involved with God as much, who'll tell you, well, I'm, I'm a murderer. I'm all right, I can do church out of my home. That's how they were. And to put that in perspective for you, what happened in our own history 100 years ago? Less than 100 years ago, we had some of the biggest atrocities during warfare, right? In what was known as the largest war ever to occur. And yet, how fresh does that feel in our mind, the history during World War I? It feels like centuries upon centuries ago. Ancient history. That's how they felt. So when Jeremiah shows up in Israel and he's looking at them, telling them, you know what? You're being evil. You need to repent. He's going to cast you out. They think he's kind of crazy because they've got a little money in their pocket. Assyria is gone. Babylon sure is raising up, but they're nowhere near what Assyria was at that time. And Egypt, although they just killed Josiah, really isn't that much of a thorn in their side as long as they leave them alone and send them a little money. They're doing good. So Jeremiah's message wouldn't put people in the pews. It wouldn't scratch their ears. It wouldn't fill a plate on Sunday morning or Saturday if you're Jewish. Right? And instead, what it would get is people to look at you, say you're crazy, and ignore your message. And that's in fact what happened to them. Oftentimes they ignored, but many times they beat him, they tortured him, they made fun of him, and they sent him on his way. So what was his ministry? What was he called to do? As I said, he started during King Josiah. So he was in a relative period of prosperity when Josiah was getting rid of pagan worship and trying to get Israel on the right track. So God said, go to the northern kingdom, those remnant that are still there, and tell them to come down to Judah, to move in, right? To be part of the, that kingdom, to be engrafted into the kingdom of God again, right? And they would not listen. And he uses imagery where he tries to show how they just abandoned and left their faith. He describes the northern kingdom as a newfound bride who trusted in God, who followed him through the desert, and was given this land, but then turns around and says, you turned my land into an abomination, and that's why you were sent on your way. I'm paraphrasing. He tells them and explains to them that there is, if you have repentance, 
a way to be brought back, and they do not listen. From there, he starts to be sent to Judah and the people of Judah, right? Because the northern kingdom, what's left of them, are not going to come back. And as he's going around the people of Judah and he's describing to them their faithlessness, he tells them to have faith, to trust, and to repent. And constantly the people gave him a response of the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And what they meant by that was, you know, you're talking about having us destroyed. That applied to the northern kingdom. It doesn't apply to us. We have the temple of God. God will not come in and destroy his own temple. He's promised this to us. And they kept about their way. God would not leave us because he gave us this land. He chose Jerusalem above all cities. And this is where his temple is. And they went about their way. And so he describes to them what kind of faith they need and what they're lacking. Especially after a point when they said, you know what? Babylon's getting kind of big. We need to make alliances. And they started to go out to the neighboring nations, the pagan nations, and bribe them to join them in a revolt against Nebuchadnezzar. God says to them, you are putting faith in the wrong people, in other nations. You're putting it in a man, not, by flood, and not in me. And he describes them as a terrorist tree. What he says is you're going to be like that tree, which is very common in that area, something we've never really seen. It's a dry shrub with a couple of flowers on it that grows in an arid place, a desert. It has very little use other than shade in the desert. And in fact, the people of Israel often used it as fertilizer. They would cut it down, burn it up, and spread the ash. That's how he described their faith. He said you could be a big billowing tree next to a flowing river, never having to worry about drought, never having to worry about flight or anything else coming to that tree because you would be stable, drinking the water from that flowing river, that living water. And instead, they chose to be in that dry desert as a shrub tree that was good to be burned up. So obviously, people were not happy to see Jeremiah come. Which brings us to our message today. And whenever we're reading it, we're saying, okay, it sounds as if he had a little down day, but then he gives in to God. But I don't think we get the full perspective of what was happening. Just prior to that, Jeremiah was sent out to a valley. And that valley is just right outside of Jerusalem. In fact, if you're on the Temple Mount, you can look down and see it. And it was often, often referenced by many prophets. This valley is right outside the potsherd gate, and they called it that because people would bring their pots that were broken, their cisterns, and they would throw it down the valley. Nobody wanted to live at the bottom of the valley, so it became what? A trash heap, a dump. And in this dump, they would have fires lit to burn up that trash. And God tells Jeremiah, go over there and preach my message of repentance. And he does so. He stands in the dump and preaches that message of repentance as people are coming by dropping their trash. And he's telling them, this is going to happen to you. He holds up a pot and he breaks it. And he says, this will be your kingdom. Does he end there? No. He walks up from the valley to the temple mount and walks into the temple and he starts to get the same message. And inside the temple, the head of the Levites, the one in charge of keeping order and good discipline, inside of the temple, does not like his message and has him beaten. And then throws him in stocks for the evening and puts him in display outside the gate. So as people came and went, they got to see this poor man stuck in stocks, bleeding from head to toe from his beating and said, this is what will happen to you if you disrupt the worship of God. Does that end Jeremiah? No. He's released the next day, and what does he do? He walks up to that head of the Levites, and he stands in his face, and he says, God's changed your name. It's going to mean terror on every side. And you go, what does that mean, terror on every side? Well, it means that everybody around that person will be dead. 
as he looks to his left, to his right, and behind them, that person will have terror all around him, and he will live as he's taken into another country with those images you grafted into his head. So that's when the reader gets pumped up. That's when the reader says to themselves, Jeremiah's kind of tough. But then we're let in, and the readings don't really tell, show you the full picture, but we're let in as to why he was called the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet Jeremiah, at this point, you would think he's pretty emboldened, and instead goes to God and says, why did you call me to do this? He's had enough. He was beaten the night before. He was imprisoned the night before. He was a display and ridiculed. He has done. He doesn't want this calling. How many of us have had that at some point in our life? If you haven't yet, you haven't lived long enough yet. Because I guarantee at some point in your life, you're going to feel like God is telling you to do something. You're going to see him drive you to make a decision that ends up fruitless or bears no fruit. And it may be for a lifetime. You will eventually be told to do things like, oh, it's probably time to get in the house. Uh-oh, lost your job. Hey, you should marry this person. Uh-oh, they left you. Hey, you should teach your kids about Christ. Uh-oh, they don't believe. And each time you're going to sit back, crushed, going, are you playing a game with me? Why did you pull the rug out from under my feet? And you will give up. If you don't, it will happen eventually. That has not happened up to this point. And you know what? God understands. He's got big shoulders. He bears that very well. We have to look at Jeremiah and others like him and to see the example that's painted for us, that he let people like Jeremiah fall so we would have an example for ourselves to give us encouragement. Because Jeremiah isn't just down. He is so down, he says, I do not know why you called me this. I wish I hadn't been born. And then on top of that, he says, curse the guy that told my mother she was pregnant. you got to be pretty down to curse the doctor that tells your mom she's going to have a baby. And he did not want to do this. But it doesn't end there. He goes further. And what he says is what we had in our reading today, that I can't quit. I want to quit. I want to stop this calling. I want to ignore God, but it's like a fire welling up inside me, uncontrolled, and it has to get out. And he's looking at God, seeing that uncontrolled fire, and he's saying, I really don't want to do this but I only feel relief. I only feel the pressure that I'll go a little bit when I do what you told me to do. And we have to understand that that should be what drives us. When we look at him and we say, what's the example Jeremiah is trying to teach us? It's that that fire that he's talking about should be what drives you into your calling. And if it ain't there, that ain't your calling. No matter what that may be, and it could be an occupation, it could be prayer, it could be being a good spouse or a good parent or whatever, but that fire is what drives you. Now I tried to think a little bit about an illustration with what that fire, how to describe it, and I remember at a time when I lived in California, about three or four years, and I loved it. I really loved it. The weather is great. It's perfect. It's not like here. And there's In-N-Out Burger. If anybody's from there, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And a whole bunch of other stuff. But there's one flaw with the place. And the flaw is it gets really dry in Southern California. I mean, really dry, like a haystack. And all it takes is one cigarette, one match, one campfire, and thousands of acres go up in seconds. And I got to see that firsthand whenever we were doing a training op in the Marines and somebody took a smoke grenade and thought they were going to be a hero and threw it in a place they shouldn't have. Right? And they went out like John Wayne and did one of those overarch things and it landed. And if you've ever seen a smoke grenade, it makes a lot of fire. 
and it lit it, and it took about 45 Marines really quick with good leather boots to stomp like crazy to try to put it out before it really got out of hand. It went quick, and it covered about 30 feet. That's a small microcosm of what Jeremiah is describing. And if you feel that inside, when you're doing what you think you should be doing, that means God's smiling. Right? And you need to remain faithful to that. No matter what it may be. Because you will be fulfilling what he designed you to do. Not what you wanted to do. Right? Who remembers St. Augustine's mother? Somebody would know personally, but... Right? Did she get to see the con uh, conversion of her son? No. No. She prayed for it a whole lot. But she didn't see him until she passed. What if she would have gave up? Who's driven over here and seen that little Planned Parenthood clinic with the one lone old man or old lady that's out there praying every single day? I'm pretty sure they didn't stop anybody most of the time. What if they give up? What if they stop? What happens to us? See, what's interesting about this valley, some of the reforms that Josiah had whenever he went in there, is the valley just wasn't a trash dump. Throughout Israel's history, it was a temple or a worship center where people offered their sacrifices to Moloch. And if you're not familiar with Moloch, Moloch was a pagan god, Canaanite god, in which people offered their children as sacrifices. And they would do so, it would be a bull-shaped head with arms stretched out. And they would light a fire under Moloch inside this statue, blazing hot. Think Daniel. Right? And then they would dance and make a bunch of noise because that was to drown out the children's screams as they put them into that statue. That's what Josiah had destroyed when he became king, and that's what started right back up in the same exact place the moment he had passed. That is why God sent him to that valley. That's why he threatens to throw them out. And they needed to hear it. Just like the people who are going into the clinic need to hear the prayers of the one lone person that's faithful, doing what they're called to do. Interestingly enough, that valley we should all really be familiar with. It doesn't ring a bell whenever you give the uh, Jewish name. But a little bit later, it gets another name in Greek, Gehenna. Right? And Christ used to sit up there all the time pointing to it and describing what? The pains of hell. Where people go who do not follow. And as he stood on top of the Mount of Olives, he was just a man God and man, but he was a man praying for what? Deliverance from that calling. So much so, he dripped blood. Probably looked down into that valley. But how did he finish up? Not my will, but yours be done. If you follow the example of Christ, and you follow the example of Jeremiah, you're allowed to lament thinking at your calling, right? Because what the world judge is, judges you as doesn't really matter as long as you're fulfilling that calling. And if you keep that in the back of your head and then have the faith that Jeremiah was calling them to and trust in God, there'll be rewards and it might not happen in your lifetime. Like Jeremiah, you might go home and never see one convert according to your work. You might live to 80 years old and not understand why you had that cross to bear all 80 years. But one day it'll make sense. And you just have to trust him. Amen?